thank you everyone for giving me the chance to talk a little bit about Hipfort because I don't think it's well known to most people. And so, yeah, the presentation title is Present and Future Direction for Portable GPU Programming in Fortran. And just a little introduction about myself. You may read, you know, if you know me, you know that I worked previously at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. And I moved to AMD about a year ago uh, to join the Center of Excellence on Frontiers. So what I'm doing right now is uh, make sure that Exascale application run fine on this fine computer that we are trying to build at Oak Ridge. So what is HIP, first of all? Um, it's basically, HIP is the heterogeneous computer interface for portability. And it's nothing but a C++ runtime API and kernel language that allows developers to create a portable application that run on both uh, AMD and NVIDIA accelerators. Few bullet points, uh, HIP is an open source, so you can see the source, you can contribute. It's, it's a great thing, in my opinion, to have open source software. Uh, provides an API uh, for an application to leverage GPU acceleration for both uh, vendors, major vendors at the moment. It's syntactically similar to CUDA, so if you are familiar with CUDA, uh, you can just write HIP by just replacing the CUDA prefix with HIP. And I will, I will not talk much about how to do this transformation or, or as we call it, hippification, but feel free to reach out to me. My email address is just my first name, dot my last name at amd.com. I'll be happy to answer all your questions. And finally, it supports a strong subset of all the CUDA runtime functionality. And this is just a little chart to show you what happens. You write your head code, uh, which is you know just a bunch of calls to this uh, C++ APIs. And based on what you have, the compiler under, you know, translates into CUDA or HIP. So if you don't know what GPU programming looks like, this slide will be may, may, may be useful for you. If you do know what GPU programming is, it's going to be pretty boring, but please bear with me for a moment. So if you have this embarrassingly parallel loop in C, for example, which you have in an array and you multiply by two each and every item of the array, this gets translated into a kernel, GPU kernel, with the syntax. So um, what happens is that a device function, which is this kernel that gets executed on the device, will be launched from the host. Um, and it must be declared with the global attribute, first of all. And in order to be called from the host, it needs to be declared as void. One thing that you may notice is that this pointer has a different name from this one and this distance for device. So what happens is that when you are want to run on a GPU, you need to uh, have memory that is visible from for the GPU and you need to allocate the memory from the host uh, with certain function that I'll show you later. But memory is different from host to, C to GPU at the moment. Uh, ideally, all the threads in this kernel on the GPU will be executed simultaneously between quotes because it's not really true, but it looks like that, it feels like that. And each thread will use a certain unique thread and block ID to compute a global address. And this is what happens. You basically have this I that has a different value based on which thread we are running on. And you have certain, if you are familiar with CUDA, you know what I'm talking about. Explaining how to program GPUs is not the purpose of this talk, but you basically have a bunch of threads into blocks and you have a bunch of blocks in a grid. And thanks to that, you can compute a unique identif identifier for a thread and operate on all the values of the uh, array that you want to multiply by two in parallel, ideally. Uh, this is what looks like on the host side. So when you want to invoke a kernel, you have to decide how many threads you want to run, uh, how many blocks you need based on the size that you have, because you may have you may need more, uh, a little more blocks than your size for, you know, to fit all the elements. This is what I was talking about. This hip malloc in this case allocates memory on this D underscore A pointer uh, that is visible to the GPU and, you know, the GPU can access. Then you have other functions like ipmem copy that allows you to copy the data from the host to the device and vice versa when you want to get the results back from the device to host. This is what HIP uses to um, launch a kernel. But we also uh, understand the Chevron syntax, which is typical for CUDA. So if you have a GPU application, you don't need to bother of using the syntax. This is just a little bit more explicit. 
personally, uh, I don't love it because it's hard to remember for me this name, but uh, it works in both ways. So it's just two different ways to do the same thing. And then you have to free the memory on the GPU at the end of the program to make sure that it doesn't stick. Uh, the only difference, if you're familiar with CUDA, this is not important for this talk, but the only difference between CUDA and HIP is that our, um, our, our blocks are executed in 64 white chunks called wavefronts instead of 32 uh, warps, as CUDA calls them. That's the only difference you need to keep in mind if you're porting your code from CUDA to HIP and you want to run it on AMD. Because if you want to run it on CUDA using HIP, this is not a problem. Uh, just to mention something that will be important later on during my Fortran side of the presentation, Rockam also provides several GPU and math libraries, uh, GPU math libraries. The confusing part for most users is that there are two versions. One is the Rock star version and the other one is the HIP star version. Uh, when you are developing an application, and you're meant to target uh, both CUDA and MD devices. So you want compatibility. So you want to write just the HIP FFT, for example, or HIP plus version. You want to do that for portability reasons. Uh, that will be portable, but performance may be suboptimal between the architectures. On the other hand, if you're targeting just AMD devices, for example, you want to write software that will run just on Frontier or El Capitan, uh, you want to use the rock conversion. Why is that? Because potentially, and this happens for certain libraries, uh, we use certain APIs that are more efficient for what we do under the hood. So you basically have the HIP, for example, the HIP plus, and HIP plus basically maps onto Rock Blast or Cube Blast according to which hardware you are targeting. If you're using Rock Blast, you are tied to AMD. So this is just the, 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 the main difference between these two versions. Okay, let's go to the Fortran side of things. That was just an introduction that may will make hopefully the rest of the presentation a little more understandable for people not super familiar with GPU programming. So um, unfortunately, uh, there is no HIP equivalent to CUDA Fortran. So if you are familiar with CUDA Fortran and you want to write something with uh, for AMD hardware, you cannot use that. You need to uh, do something else. And that's where the HIP Fort and uh, Fortran aspect comes in uh, into play. So HIP function in the end are callable from C using the extern C function. So they can be called directly from Fortran. So what you do, it's what would you expect? And you probably, most of you already do this if you do uh, GPU programming in Fortran. You manually write your kernel in HIP in C++. That's the first one. So you grab whatever you have in CUDA Fortran or whatever you want to write on the CPU from the GPU. If you're starting from scratch, you manually write it in HIP in C++. Then you wrap the kernel launch, just that function that launches the kernel with a number of uh, threads and blocks into a C function. You uh, and then you call that C function for Fortran using our beloved ISO C binding. This has many advantages uh, because this strategy should be uh, usable by Fortran users since it's standard and it should be supported by all compilers. Also because Fortran has an interface layer it's called the HIPFORT, which provides all the wrapper bindings for use uh, for you know for you to use it in Fortran. And the wrapper bindings are basically things like the wrapper for HIP malloc, the wrapper for him map copy, the wrapper for him free, and all the various API that HIP has. So that saves you time and doesn't uh, require you to reinvent the wheel and write uh, all those wrappers on your own. So it's very convenient. If you I put some links into Slack in the conference channel. And I encourage you, if you are curious about to see the code, to just visit those three links. Uh, you need to download this aside. So if you are installing Rockham on your machine, and you don't you follow the instructions that are listed on the Rockham web page, uh, you will not get hip fort automatically by default. You have to download it with Git. Once you download it, it's all open source and it's all Fortran, and it's super easy to use if you're familiar with that. Um, also, hip fort doesn't just provide um, interfaces for HIP function, HIP APIs like HIP, um, HIP malloc, HIP map copy, but also to the HIP uh, uh, interfaces for the libraries and the rock interfaces for the libraries. So this basically allow any Fortran programmer to write, to use the whole uh, um, Rockham ecosystem from Fortran. 
These are a few instructions if you're curious to install and use hip fork, it's very easy to install. And I always use this backed add example, which is very uh, straightforward to follow. I'll show some code. So if you are, if you don't, if you don't want to check that code uh, while I'm talking, uh, you can still see what I'm talking about. But if you visit the second link that I posted, the one from tests, you will see that that particular directory has two uh, directories inside. One is called F2003 and one is called F2008. That means that hip fort exposes two different ways of doing ISO C binding and exposing the APIs. One is the old fashioned Fortran 2003, and one is the new one, Fortran 2008. And the rest of the presentation is just me talking about pros and cons of these two versions and my idea of what we should be doing for uh, by adopting Fortran 2018. So this is what the Fortran vector ad, Fortran 2003 vector ad looks like. On the left here, hopefully you, will, you can see my cursor, you'll have um, the interface to the function that you wanna launch. In this case, it's just vector add. And this is the Fortran code. Uh, this Fortran 2003 version is the most explicit, the one that I use the most, the, probably the one that you are the, the most familiar with. And it's very explicit. You have to deal with this type C pointer. You have to carry them around for the, the device memory that you want to allocate. Uh, you may want to use some object oriented programming technique to make them more comfortable, but everything gets very explicit. You know exactly that that DA, it's a C pointer, it's allocated in memory from a function that's probably hip malloc, and that's it. You don't have any Fortran inside of what this is, what's its rank, what's its shape, what's its type, you know nothing. You just know that it's a C, uh, type C pointer which is fine, but it's error prone. Uh, also, you need to uh, remember how big the, the memory that's allocated at this particular uh, portion of uh, chunk of memory is. And also you have to deal with the C sides of C float and so on. So I am a C++ C++ uh, programmer. I don't mind doing this, I'm used to it, but for Fortran programmer it can be very time consuming, error prone, tedious. The code is not as uh, readable as it's, you know, as it is normally. So I can see why this can be a pain. Um, what do you do then if you want to run this uh, kernel that you wrote uh, in it somewhere else uh, from Fortran, you just call this subroutine. There is a regular uh, ISO C binding uh, interface and it calls the same function name, uh, you can specify a different name, of course, it's called launch. And what it does is that uh, with extern C, you call this C function that has just the uh, uh, launch, uh, the, basically the launch function, the launch subroutine that we use in HIP to uh, invoke this kernel. Uh, you can see that um, uh, this is basically the name of the kernel that we are launching. This is the number of uh, blocks, this is the number of threads and other para and this is basically shared memory, the stream. I'm not talking about this. If you're curious, just ask. And then you have the arguments that this function takes. And as you can see, this is in the same file. Basically, you can put the kernel that you want to invoke. It will return. And then you can basically copy the data back uh, with the device to host it and copy. And everything is great. It works. It's very solid. It's the most ancient thing you can do, but it's, it's solid. So. Um, if you are comfortable with this, you don't have to bother with Fortune 2008 or more, but this is what the Fortune 2008 interface instead expects you to, to use. And it's a little better, but it has some uh, problems under the hood. Not problems for the user, mostly for the library developers. And as you may imagine, you know, if you are a Fortune expert about this, you may already imagine what's going on. Uh, you have, again, your interface has changed a little bit. Now we are passing the also the, number of blocks, number of threads, share memory, the stream to the launch function uh, that we are going to invoke to C and C++. And then what happens is that the device memory is no longer a C pointer, but it's actually what it's uh, what you decide. It's basically in this case a real eight and it's an array of a single rank and you have this three arrays and of course, if you know Fortune doesn't need how this works, it has to be a pointer if you want to do what I'm about to show here. Then the code allocates the memory on the host with allocate. Uh, of course, there is a parenthesis missing here, but it's you know, this is just to give you an idea. And then what you do is just to invoke hip malloc 
with uh, just specifying the number of elements. So you don't first you don't have to uh, deal with um, the size of real eight. That will be taken care of by uh, hip fort internally. So that's the first thing you don't have to do. The second thing is that um, you just take this real pointer and this function recognizes it. The other cool thing that you can do, and this is very useful, is that imagine that you initialize this B vector and you can use this source attribute, which is very similar to what you would do in allocate. And then allocate the memory on the GPU and copy the data, and basically not copy the data, but also make sure that what you're doing, it's consistent with um, what you're passing. So it's another, it's a further check, it's more convenient and allocates memory for you automatically. Um, you do this type DIM3 grid and block uh, directly in Fortran this time, just to show something different. You copy the memory from host to device 4A, bits already there, you can launch it, and then you copy everything back on the out. What's the problem with this approach that is very nice? For the user, there is no problem. But if you open the third link, which is the hip malloc version that we have on Ipfort, you will see this situation here where you have an interface for if malloc, which is basically what this matches to. Uh, you have this function, which calls the actual uh, if malloc in hip, but then you have all this module procedure and you have to enroll all the possible cases that this if malloc function may encounter. So you may have the logical for scalar when you have the source, the logical for array for rank one when you have the source, the logical for array one when you don't have the source, you have just a, 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 this end that it's a sit int. Then you have the, the logical rank one when you have a C size, and then you have the logical for array one. Uh, this two, I think it, it's about, um, this is a mistake, it should be two, but you got the gist. You have to do this for all the types, all the ranks, and it's gonna be pretty tedious to do and error prone. Internally, we do it in an automated way, so it's not a big deal, but that's what it works. And that's what it happens, for example, for the integer, um, this is just an array of rank one with C sides, so there is no source. And what you do is just, you call the if malloc with C pointer that it's internally declared with the size that you inferred by the, the the size that got passed, and then you call the CF pointer inside with the shape that you have, you already know what it is because it's matched. Uh, I cannot see the, the questions. If you have any questions about that, please speak up. Um, otherwise, I can go, move forward and then we can talk about this later. For the Fortran, to, for the mem copy is the same tedious thing to do. So it's very tedious on the, on the library side to do these things. I don't have much time, so I will go a little bit to, faster on the Fortune 2018 side. What we want to do for Fortune 2018? Uh, Fortune 2018 uh, introduces low level C interoperability, which is extremely useful for this case. So um, we use basically assumed type and assumed rank to apply it to him that copy. So what we do is that we declare this function inside um, Hipfort that has assumed uh, type. And assumed rank. So we don't have to do all that enroll, uh, you know, unrolling of uh, possibilities that we have, in particular for the hip mem copy. But we can still keep the meaning into the Fortran side uh, of declaring the device memory as a Fortran object, because at that point we can just pass the C lock of the des destination and source to hip mem copy, which is this function here. And this matches basically to what HIP is exposing. So we, what we do is basically we keep on the application side the clear, the, the clear um, ex, you know, exposure of the variables on the GPU. But then under the hood, we do this trick of dealing with assumed type and assumed rank. And we do with C lock. Uh, this works great. It's, it's much cleaner and it's basically the same result. What I'm really excited about, and we are not still using it, but we have many ideas on how to do this, and this is going to be my last slide, so please bear with me for uh, you know, the next five minutes, is that Fortune 2018 also exposed the C descriptor. Uh, so from I, did, I took this from ISO C Fortran by Minji Fortran. The C descriptor, the CFI C desk T, it's something standard. And this got exposed by the compiler so that 
Fortran can actually pass this to C routines, and the C routines can actually operate, allocate, and deallocate Fortran objects uh, from C, which is extremely powerful. Uh, these first three elements are uh, has to be, you know, are decided. The last one has to be the stem, and these three have to be present. But if you know you're a compiler developer and you want to add something else, feel free to do this because this can be, uh, you know, there there might be more items in this um, fields in this structure uh, after version and before them. What you can do, in case you don't know it, is that you can write a C function like this, and what you receive for Fortran in this this descriptor. And for example, you can start calculating how many elements you have in an array by using the syntax, because this is standard. So you can, it's guaranteed that this will be there and it will have the meaning that is expected uh, according to what the standard has decided. I am a C programmer, so I might be tempted to say, hey, you know what, I can use this for it malloc, because it might be just, I can avoid to do that tedious work of enrolling all the possibility with it malloc by just passing the descriptor and the size, and then I do this base address because this is this base address here is just the address of the array that it's in Fortran. This is not allowed. This is absolutely not allowed. This is not good because all the changes to the C descriptor must be done via the CFI star function. In this case, would be a CFI allocate if I remember correctly. So. Uh, we can still do a bunch of things with this descriptor. I could have done what I've showed you before with them copy with this by passing the descriptor and we can see it's perfectly fine, but you cannot allocate memory or deallocate memory that has not been allocated uh, by the compiler or with the, with the CFI uh, functions. So I would just want to thank the main uh, four contributors that are Dominic Charrier, Greg Rogers and Paul Bowman. And this was my last slide, so thanks for your attention, and I'll be glad to answer all your questions that you have. Thank you, Alessandro, for your presentation. I see there is a question in the Slack channel that said uh, with the Fortran uh, 2018 uh, C descriptor, will Fortran user defined types uh, be able to be allocated on the device with the hit malloc? No, that's exactly my last slide. You cannot do that. That was the point of my last slide. slide. So yeah, you still need to allocate the the the, the memory on the device uh, with the hip malloc version. I mean, the user will not see it, but for a library perspective, you cannot allocate it on the, on the on the C side. You still had to go through the Fortran and decide which one is the, the, the right one and then pass the C, the, the C pointer, the C lock, basically. Thank you. I see that. Uh, so, okay, there's another question from Harvey. Uh, mm -hmm. would, you pre uh, would you prefer that uh, you could set the pointer in the descriptor, uh, perhaps with a requirement that another field indicates? This uh, was done without a F, a C, F, a I routine. I have a use case, a use case for what where I want to use my own memory manager. So um, I'm trying to parse exactly the meaning of the question. So would you prefer that you could set the, the pointer in the descriptor? I would love to set that pointer in the descriptor with something else, but I know it's not allowed. So as a, I contribute a little bit to G Fortran in the past, so as a G, you know a compiler uh, person, I would add an extra field in the descriptor and then use that in my own pleasure without dealing with the standard at all. So I, I don't bother the standard. The standard that's uh, you know it's complete, it's solid, and then I do all my dirty things uh, without bothering anyone. That would be what I would do, but it's more invasive. I would definitely love something like an allocation where I can pass a function that, uh, like a function pointer that actually allocates the memory as I want it. But I know that it's complicated in terms of standards. Bad things can happen, of course. Also, bear in mind that those are all pointers, don't allocate allocatables in that way, uh, because allocatable, as you know, when they go out of scope, get deallocated and if the compiler cannot deallocate the memory automatically, everything blows up. So that makes Fortran very weak. So just be considerate what you do. I like the idea that the, you can only touch the, the C descriptor with Fortran uh, SFI, CFI routines. Uh, so at least uh, the code doesn't blow up in your face if you um, 
you know, if the compiler tries to deallocate something that cannot be done. Hopefully that replies the answer the question. Okay, I see that someone else is uh, typing in the chat. Uh, that is, well, yeah, was a question, but uh, it's already answered that uh, where is the heap uh, Fortran? Is uh, the link is uh, in the, has been pasted in the chat and also is conference chat. The, yeah. Yeah. Also, I mean, there is a, yeah, there is a, there is a comment that uh, Damian made uh, before about the, the for three, uh, for three uh, package. Uh, I don't know if you have seen that. Oh, I was saying that the, the Fortranos developers contributed um, to SWIG, which is a language interoperability tool. And so I, I guess someone else posted a reply to mine. So their pull request hasn't been merged yet. But I, I guess if that gets merged, then SWIG will have better modern Fortran support and it might be able to automatically generate Fortran bindings for C code. Yeah, thank you. Okay, that oh, is yeah. okay. I mean, uh, that is already done. I, I can share the slide again, but um, you do it basically like this. I was going a little fast, I apologize. But yeah, the if you see the cursor here, let me put it on full screen. That's how you do it. Basically, you have this pointer with the device, uh, the DA variable, which to Fortran looks like just a pointer, but you know the rank and you know that it's a you know real eight, and then you can allocate that with this hip malloc, which is exposed by the, the library. The concern that I'm uh, you know exposing here it's not from the user side because the user doesn't really care what's happening in the back. It's more on the library development side, which really benefits from this Fortran 2018 new features that allow to shrink the amount of code that we have to replicate and potentially we uh, you know reduce the bug. The bugs that we, you know, may may be um, exposed. Hopefully, that answered the questions. The, the memory can always be allocated with the heap malloc, but what happens behind uh, behind the scenes is that you are still passing a C lock test here in the specific function that you have to write, and this can be hundreds if you want to enroll all the possible cases. So the library side is the problem here; that it's very verbose. Whereas with this other solution, you just have this function that does the job for you and you still pass the C log, but you only have one function instead of hundreds. So, because you have assumed type and assumed rank. So that's kind of one of the advantages of Fortune 2018, which I really like. Cool. So yeah, I see that. Uh, thanks uh, for the presentation and answering the questions. So I think the discussion can continue in uh, Slack.